Welcome to Native Talk Arizona, presented by Native Health and KRDP 90.7 FM. Later in the show, Janice Garib and Norman Patrick Brown will tell us about the Nineta Drama Festival, and we'll learn about Indigenous Education Incorporated, home of the Cobell Scholarship with Melvin Monet Barajas. But right now, host Lanasha Pawati talks with Alicia Good Soldier, Language and Culture Coordinator for the Phoenix Indian Center. I'm host Lanasha Pawati. Alicia Good Soldier is the Language and Culture Coordinator for the Phoenix Indian Center and is in the studio today to talk about the upcoming second annual Indigenous Art Market and Indigenous Community Fashion Showcase. Hello, Alicia. It's an honor to have you on our show today. Hello. And before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and about your Indigenous heritage? Sure. Um, so, yat e shik e do shidin e sh e lisha good soldier yin e shia. Tuo heg lini ni shle do na kai ba shish chin. Na slande ne e da shi che do na kai da shi nala. So my name is Alicia Good Soldier, and I am the Language and Culture Coordinator at the Phoenix Indian Center. I am an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation, and I also belong to the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation of uh, Fort Totten, North Dakota. Um, I grew up um, in Lupton, Arizona, on the Navajo Reservation, um, and then also here in the Valley. Um, and I left Phoenix when I was uh, 20 years old, living in South Dakota and Colorado, before returning to the Valley in the fall of 2021. And then I began my work at the Phoenix Indian Center. Oh, wow, awesome. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you today. You. Um, and to talk about more, can you tell us first uh, a little bit about the Phoenix Indian Center? Sure. So the Phoenix Indian Center is the largest, oldest um, urban Indian center in the country. And last year we celebrated 75 years in the valley. And so um, annually we are serving um, about 9,000 people. Um, from about 90 tribes um, through direct services in the areas of workforce development, uh, youth services, uh, language and cultural enrichment, and then also substance abuse and suicide prevention programming. Um, And then we also get to provide services through um, what we call special projects, such as the upcoming Indigenous Art Market and Fashion Show. Oh, wow. That is awesome. It's a lot of great um, resources out there for the community. Um, And talking about the Indigenous Art Market, can you give us some more um, details about the upcoming Indigenous Art Market and the Indigenous Community Fashion Show? Sure. So we are in our second year of the Spring Art Market and the Community Fashion Showcase, which is going to happen on Saturday, March 4th at uh, the Phoenix Indian Center in the open parking lot behind our building. That's the art market. So we're going to have over 50 indigenous vendors um, from about 9 a.m. to about 3 p.m. We're gonna have food vendors from Emerson's Food Truck, Val's Fry Bread, uh, Space Coffee, and then also um, Blue Nadant Sweets, um, which are all indigenous owned food businesses here in the Valley. Um, And our music is going to be provided by Sean Martinez, a.k.a. DJ Tribal Touch, um, who's the entertainment director of uh, the Phoenix Suns and also a really great partner um, with the Phoenix Indian Center. So it's free admission, free parking. um, And just in case anybody's wondering, we did sell out. Um, on all of our vendor spaces, um, but we do have a wait list. So if you're interested, feel free to contact us at the Phoenix Indian Center if, if you want to get on that wait list. Um, and then with regards to the fashion show, um, just like our inaugural fashion show in 2022, we're heading back to Brophy College Preparatory. So we've been really fortunate to cultivate a partnership with Brophy um, over the last year and really grateful to them for allowing us to to utilize their space again. And last year, you know, we had a really great turnout, amazing turnout, and I think this year just really proves to be um, even more amazing. Um, last year, um, 
like I said, last year's was was a really great turnout, and we're hoping to like double the amount of people that we had last year. Um, so the night is going to be emceed by Aseki LaFrance Chachere, um, who's the uh, Navajo founder of Ashe Beauty, um, which is a luxury skincare and cosmetics brand, um, and she's coming from Windorock. And we are going to have a silent auction and a judged community fashion showcase that is going to be featuring our local community members. You youth, elders, um, who are going to be showcasing their traditional and contemporary designed pieces. So this could be a piece of clothing, it could be accessories, jewelry. Um, and so, and then of course, the main event of the evening, we're going to be showcasing four incredibly talented designers. Um, and they are Kathleen Tom Garcia, Cher Thomas, uh, Jared Ivins Massey, and Charlene Yellowhair Jones. Oh, wow. That is so exciting and a great way to support the indigenous vendors, community, just community in general um, out there. Can you let us know what is the goal of these programs? Right. So I think with the art market, we know we have incredible artisans in the area, right? So it gives them an opportunity to showcase their their art and then also earn an income. And we strategically have this art market the same weekend as the Herd Museum um, Indian Market. And the fact that we are just down the road from them provides that opportunity um, not only for the artisans but also for the buyers. Um, and then, you know, also just providing the opportunity for those who might not be able to get into the herd or who've been waitlisted, they can, you know, they are able to come down to our art, art market and um, show show their work. Um, and the Herd Museum's been really supportive of this, um, so that's really great um, to have their support. With regards to the fashion show, again, we really want to uplift, uh, showcase, and provide a f- platform for those who want to move into the next step of their creative journey. And so, in fact, one of our featured fashion designers, Kathleen Tom Garcia, she actually began her sewing career in one of our virtual ribbon skirt classes during the pandemic. Oh, wow. Yeah. So she had never sewn a skirt before um, or even used a... Uh, sewing machine, right? But after taking the class and and working on her sewing, she really began to cultivate her talent. Um, and so she began to make more skirts and then eventually found her way into our community fashion showcase last year. Um, and she placed first in her category. And, and so this year, we actually invited her to teach ribbon skirt making classes for our community. And then, of course, um, invited her to be one of our featured fashion designers. And so I think that's the, the impetus for our work is providing opportunities for our community and seeing them come full circle. Oh, yes, that is so amazing. Um, is there anything else you would like to share with our listeners? I think, um, you know, if you're interested in entering the Community Fashion Showcase, you can find the application on our website at phxindcenter.org. And then uh, also go to our social media channels on Facebook, Instagram. Um, You can uh, find the application link there. Or you could also reach out to Candice Joe at the Phoenix Indian Center at 602 Two six four six seven six eight for more information. Um, you can find information about entering the fashion show, um, purchasing your tickets, and then um, any other information about the art market as well. And you earlier you had mentioned that um, you are full for vendors. However, you do have a waiting list. Who would individuals reach out to? For that. So they can they can call um, our front desk at the Phoenix Indian Center and they'll direct you to the person who um, is taking the uh, the names for the wait list. So same information, uh, PhoenixIndianCenter.org um, or 602-264-6768. 
And can you remind us again, um, when and where is this year's second annual Indigenous Art Market and the Indigenous Community Fashion Show? Yes. So the Art Market and the Community Fashion Show will be held on Saturday, March 4th, 2023. The Art Market is going to be held at the Phoenix Indian Center across from Central High School on Central Avenue, just south of Camelback Road. Um, And it'll be in our open parking lot behind our building. Um, And it'll be from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And then the Community Fashion Showcase will follow 5.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. at Brophy College Preparatory. Awesome. Well, I would like to thank you, Alicia, for taking time out to talk to us today to tell us about this great event that is coming up on Saturday, March 4th. Thank you so much for having me and for for having us as well. Thank you so much. Coming up, Janice Garib and Norman Patrick Brown will tell us about the Deneta Drama Festival. Support for KRDP 90.7 FM comes in part from Native Health with two locations in Phoenix, 4041 North Central Avenue, Building C, near the corner of Central Avenue and Indian School Road, and at 2423 West Dunlap Avenue. Native Health is also located in Mesa at 777 West Southern Avenue, near the corner of Southern Avenue and Extension Road. Native Health provides primary medical, dental, behavioral health, WIC, and wellness services for the urban Native American community. For more information, call 602-279-5262 or visit our webpage at nativehealthphoenix.org. Welcome back to Native Talk Arizona, presented by Native Health and KRDP 90.7 FM. I'm host Lanasha Pawati. Janice Garib and Norman Patrick Brown are co-producers of the Dineta Drama Festival, preserving and celebrating Dineta language and culture by engaging Dineta in the performing arts, Hello, Janice and Norman. It's an honor to have you both on our show today. Hello. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you very much. And before we get started, can you both tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and about your Indigenous heritage? Yes. Um, my name is Norman Patrick Brown, and I'm Tim Albisi. Uh, baby taught me, Buster's team. Uh, those are my two clients. I'm from the, the Navajo Nation. I'm originally from Chinle, Arizona. And over my lifetime, I've uh, acted in professional plays, Canada, uh, New York, and um, I've done some featured roles in indie films as a professional actor. I'm also a writer, uh, director, and screenwriter, as well as a playwright. Great, and uh, this is Janice, and um, I am uh, Bilagana of uh, English, uh, Welsh, and Scottish uh, descent, and um, I live in New Mexico, and my theater journey started when I was very young, uh, 10 years old. I was an usher at the Old Globe Theater in uh, San Diego, and um, I've done... uh, Gosh, uh, not in front of the, the theater, but behind the scenes have uh, run a theater company and uh, done things like been on book and run, um, gosh, box office 
Um, and I'm also a, a produced playwright. Um, I've had three of my plays um, produced. So it's it's been a constant throughout my life. Oh, wow. Thank you both for for sharing that. Um, can you guys let us know or tell us more about the Danetta Dra- Drama Festival? Um, this idea initially started in uh, 1990. I created a proposal for the Gray Hills Academy High School. And the proposal was developing the drama festival with high school students utilizing the novel language. And the foundation and basis of that festival was to uh, create an avenue for young people to utilize the Navajo language in terms of its creative process, uh, what the young people had to say uh, about their history, about themselves, about their community, about their ancestors and what the future portends. So we had four years of uh, that drama festival. It was very, very successful. We've you know, and we had over um, 100 students participate across Navajo Nation, 10 high schools. And at the end, we had best actor, best actress, you know, best playwright, best director. So it was all student driven. And they wrote and directed their own plays under the guidance of Navajo language teachers and drama teachers. Yeah, so that was the that was the start, and um, and Norman was was it um, for that start, and so what we've done is kind of re reintroduced it, um, not just for high school students, but also for adults as well, with some of the same you know with the same purpose of you know language and culture, traditional stories, um, and um, be young people and older people to be able to express you know, in their own voice and their own stories and um, their own language. If you, if you know, I mean, what is happening across uh, indigenous America right now is there's a loss of language and it's in all tribes. And this was our way of preserving the language from the creative process. Also um, the stories to help heal our communities, uh, our families within ourselves with our messages. Oh, yes, yeah. definitely. And Norman, um, you mentioned Gray Hill. So does this take place in, is it Tuba City? Yeah, I was in Tuba City, but right now we're, we're looking at a couple avenues. Um, one is the UNM Gallup branch, as well as the, um, the theater in, in Gallup. Gallup, New Mexico, and um, it, the important thing of the drama festival is, is that uh, we have uh, advisors. Uh, there are cultural advisors, uh, linguists, now for language advisors, um, as well as other artists, creative artists within the Navajo community. And what is the mission or goal of the Dineta Drama Festival? Yeah, so as Norman mentioned, um, definitely language, um, you know, retention and revitalization is one of our top go- top goals um, in this process. Um, also to create kind of a theater industry, um, you know, on the Navajo Nation and in the, you know, surrounding um, border towns. Um, it's also, uh, you know, looking at um, historical trauma, you know, being able to tell those stories, um, you know, from from the Diné perspective. Um, as well, um, you know, theater is just a wonderful medium for healing. Um, it's been shown to help heal trauma. It's been shown to um, help uh, at-risk um, students um, and young people. Obviously, it's a great way of uh, people finding their own voice and what it is that they need to say. Um, so all of those things are, are part of them part of the mission it's a pretty big mission (laughs) and goal but um to be able to see people um be able to create and share and uh you know try new things um it's just wonderful to see i i might add that um indigenous cultures worldwide but specifically in the north america as well as uh the the people the the no language um our ceremonies, our songs and chants, our stories, and the strength of these songs and uh, chants in oral history has really gave us the resiliency 
and the, the strength uh, to overcome, you know, the, the colonialization obstacles as well as manifest destiny. And uh, uh, storytelling is uh, the foundation of all indigenous societies. And within the Navajo Nation, you know, in the, in the winter, we're told stories about moral, how to live a, a, a good life, uh, values and ideals. And uh, the way to teach our children is using, you know, different animals and birds, you know, and in, in, in guiding them on the right path in, in this role of being a, a good human being. And um, Norman, did you say that high school students that participate in this, are they all over like high schools from all over the Navajo reservation? Yeah, we had um, initially in the beginning, we had six schools uh, located on the Navajo Nation. And towards the end of the four years, we had 10 schools participate. And it was just one of the most incredible, it's just, it was just an incredible festival to see. We had students that came the full four years. And over the years, I've seen them in, you know, supermarkets or, you know, uh, restaurants and, hey, Mr. Brown, you remember me? I said, yeah, you're one of the hundred, you know, that came. And, you know, they're very successful. A lot of them are, are, are nurses and, you know, they're carpenters. Well, I mean, it's just a really good that they, they, they acknowledge uh, how the festival helped them, you know, within their own personal lives as well as their, their creative process and the work that they do. Oh, wow. You guys are really making a difference in um, the youth. Um, But Norman and Janice, can you let us know, are there any upcoming chances for people to submit playwriting scripts? Uh, Yeah, right now we have our um, short works competition. Um, That's what's kind of up up front. Um, The deadline is actually right now February 28th and um, assuming we'll have enough plays coming in um, we might we might extend but go for this February 28th if someone is interested Um, that short competition is uh, basically 10 minute plays so it's 10 pages and um, there are four categories that someone can submit to and um, that being you know adults um, in uh, Diné and in uh, or in English and then youth under 18 in Diné or in English and the theme for that is a Diné matriarch. So that's what's uh, kind of uh, coming up uh, the most quickly. <laughs> yeah, we uh, the festival is, is honoring the the resiliency and the strength and foundation of um, the the Diné matriarchs in Navajo society. For you know, we we the first uh, when we introduce ourselves, the first time we introduce is our mother's clan. And and what we wanted to is acknowledge the role of the Navajo women through history uh, in terms of uh, their guidance and resistance uh, against colonialization, their guidance and, you know, moving our nation forward. There's so many stories regarding our Navajo leaders um, taking the advice of the Navajo women, the, the women, the matriarchs, own the land. You know, they, they own the livestock and the home. You know, our role as men is to protect and, and honor the women's uh, role in our society. They are truly the foundation of our people. And we're asking that all participants acknowledge uh, their plays, some some important aspects of Navajo women in, in their role in modern, uh, maybe ancient or, you know, the past societies and even the future. So, you know, we're honoring the the matriarchs, the Navajo women who have been so critical and so important to our survival. As you know, there's a Navajo Nation uh, vice president, which is very historical, who is female, and the speaker of the Navajo Nation Council is a young Diné woman. So we're, we're very excited. Uh, we have new uh, Navajo women leaders in the Navajo Nation Council. So, you know, we're real excited for the future because of the role of the Navajo women today. Going back to the to the playwright scripts and your short works, um, are they the same thing as the short works competition? Yes. Okay. Yes, that is our short works competition. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's the next one. The um, 
you know, we're trying to build a kind of a foundation of playwrights um, and uh, both in uh, English and hopefully prefer- preferably in, in the Navajo language. Um, and so some of what we found is, you know, to do a full length play or an uh, or a one act play is kind of daunting for new playwrights. Um, and so to also encourage, um, you know, the creation of smaller plays that might be a little more um, easier for some people, <laughs> you know, to start to jump into um, and do. So that's one of the reasons that we've um, started the short works competition. You know, some of the other things just to kind of stimulate and create a foundation. Also, uh, we're working on some playwriting prompt cards um, to help stimulate ideas and things like uh, telling stories and character sketches and those kinds of things. And um, we're also working on a kind of uh, Zoom, <laughs> Zoom or a video series to really talk about um, playwriting and everything from the script, script format to, you know, how do you write dialogue, uh, all of those kinds of things to keep building that um, kind of foundation or building on, you know, some of the foundation that's already there. Also, a uh, basic intro into directing, stage managing, you know, the role of lighting and mute. So these are just real simple, basic uh, exercises we wanted to share with uh, uh, possible participants and help guide them along in, you know, how, how the, uh, a play is created, developed, and utilized you know, for the Navajo public. And do either one of you have a favorite uh, story or script? Wow. <laughs> yeah, well, um, real quickly, uh, I I was, uh, one of the plays I was in was called The Estesi of Rita Joe. It was the historical play back in the 1960s that was set in Canada, the two-act play, and involved a young Native girl coming from the bush and coming, you know, uh, into the urban areas of, of Canada city and, and what she went through and how she survived. And, you know, it, it was a message of the, how uh, a young native girl was overcome by modern society. And that was one of the plays I was in. In, in fact, it, it was what guided me to where I am today. So that was one of the greatest plays that I've, I've written. The Estesi of Religio by George Riga. Yeah, I, I would just say, um, gosh, in general, there are so many plays <laughs> um, that um, have really moved me. And I think that's that's one of the beauties of being able to have uh, a lot of different voices and um, a lot of, uh, gosh, just uh, new views and um, new ways of tackling subjects. And that's partly why I was inspired to do these prompts for people um, because sometimes we get like stuck in our, you know, our own old way of, you know, kind of thinking or thinking that maybe that person or that character isn't important enough or that story isn't important enough. So I'm always awed by um, plays, um, you know, whether they're, you know, larger popular plays or homegrown stories. Um, about looking at, at things from a different angle or a different aspect or a character that you may not have originally thought was worthy of a story um, or worthy of a play, but but actually is. Well, I'd like to re-answer that question, um, thinking here. Um, I think the greatest play that I had to blessings to see and watch was the creation of these short plays, 30 minute plays created by Navajo students, all in the Navajo language. And it is just incredible to see these young people, you know, how they written, what, what they wrote and how they presented it in the, in the language. And I would say that was the greatest highlight of my life. I might add that was along with uh, Hannah Yazi, who was our cultural advisor, and uh, we wanted to dedicate this first drama festival to her. I, I had uh, mentioned that she was like the mother of modern Navajo, the Net language of theater. And she's in her late 70s now. And uh, we'd like to honor her for her guidance. And, you know, she helped create, put this, helped to put this uh, drama festival the first uh, four years. 
Oh, wow, that's amazing. And it is, like you mentioned, it is preserving um, the Navajo language. Um, and finally, how can our listeners learn more about Dineta Drama Festival and how can they contact you or who can they contact if they have further questions? Um, sure. So we, we have our website, which is dinetadramafest.org, D-I-N-E-T-A-H, drama, D-R-A-M-A, fest, F-E-S-T, dot org, all, all one word. Um, so we have a lot there on our website, and um, we can be contacted through our website, or you can email directly at dinatadramafest at gmail.com. You know, the, the strength of uh, an indigenous language to an indigenous nation is the strength of its language, or within that, that language. We communicate with the natural world through our stories of song and prayer and ceremony. So that was one of the main reasons that we put this drama festival together is to enhance our worldview as indigenous people, specifically the the Nez people, the richness of our society, the richness of our geographical sacred places. You know the the stars and the astronomy that guide us when to have ceremonies. So it, it's such a, a rich possibility, you know, of preserving our language. And I, I just like to add that. Well, I'd like to thank you both, um, Janice and Norman, for taking time out to talk to us today to tell us about this great drama festival that you guys have put together. That is a great impact to the Navajo Nation. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for having me. Thank us. you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Mm-hmm. Up next, we'll learn about Indigenous Education Incorporated. Support for KRDP 90.7 FM comes in part from Native Health, with two locations in Phoenix, 4041 North Central Avenue, Building C, near the corner of Central Avenue and Indian School Road, and at 2423 West Dunlap Avenue. Native Health is also located in Mesa at 777 West Southern Avenue near the corner of Southern Avenue and Extension Road. Native Health Family Advocates can help you enroll, renew, or update your access information. This can be done in person, on the phone, or via Zoom, days, nights, or weekends. It's fast, easy, and can make a difference in keeping your health care coverage. For more information, call 602-279-5262. Welcome back to Native Talk Arizona, presented by Native Health and KRDP 90.7 FM. I'm host Lanasha Pawati. Melvin Monette Brahas is the president and CEO of Indigenous Education, Inc., home of the Cobell Scholarship Program. Hello, Melvin. It's an honor to have you on our show today. Thank you. It's great to be here. And can you please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and your indigenous heritage? Sure. At my age, there's no such thing as a little bit, but I will <laughs> try. Um, I'm an enrolled citizen of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians in North Dakota. My parents were J.J. and Mary Monette, and my paternal grandparents are Joe and Caroline Monette, and my maternal grandparents are John and Amelia Lenore, um, all members of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians themselves. My childhood was spent there in the Turtle Mountains at the Ojibwa Indian School. During my transition into my teens, my father um, moved us to the Spirit Lake Reservation, where my mother has a lot of family as well, although they are enrolled in the Turtle Mountains. Um, I graduated from high school there at the Four Winds Community High School and went on to attend the University of North Dakota, where I obtained both my master's and my bachelor's in education. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that I've done up to the point of getting to the Cobell Scholarship Program for the state of Minnesota, the University of Minnesota, um, the American Indian Graduate Center, which is now known as Native Forward Scholars Fund, 
And it was there that I was tapped to become the first CEO or the founding CEO for the um, Cobell Scholarship Program to be administered by Indigenous Education, Inc. Oh, wow. That is amazing. And tell us more about this um, Cobell Scholarship. The Cobell Scholarship is a result of the Cobell versus Salazar settlement, which was the federal lawsuit brought against the Department of Interior regarding the mismanagement of individual Indian monies or our land that we have in trust as Native people. It took about 19 years for her to sue, win, and settle everything. That's all in the documents that I always ask people to read. As a result of that settlement, Eloise wanted to make sure that folks didn't forget what happened historically and what can be done with sound legal advice, with sound advocacy, and with a lot of persistence. So she made sure that about $60 million was set aside as individuals sold their shares in their trust. Part of the administrative dollars were set aside until the $60 million was realized. That money is set in an um, endowment into perpetuity for American Indian Alaska Native students who are enrolled members of their tribes to pursue higher education, anything from vocational through doctoral education and anything in between. Um, she really wanted to make sure that young people questioned the world around them and understood how things worked. Um, that is a quote that we use of hers quite often in our work. So we started the scholarship program in her legacy and in her name. Oh, wow. That is that is so amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Melvin. And I know you mentioned, um, is there any other eligibility requirements? I know you mentioned they just have to have um, to be enrolled in their tribe. Um, is there any other requirements? So we're always careful to say everyone needs to apply because we don't want to tell anyone they're ineligible based on who we fund, um, but applicants and recipients do need to be enrolled members of their tribe. They do need to be um, attending college full-time at a nonprofit public or private institution. On our website, there are drop-downs um, of uh, institutions, of majors, everything that kind of creates the eligibility. So if a student does not find on those drop-downs what they're interested in or the institution they're interested in, they can always email us and we will research that institution or that major and either add it or let them know that it's not something that's eligible for our funding. They need to be degree seeking, meaning they need to be enrolled in the institution, um, not just students who are just taking classes for the sake of taking classes. And they also need to complete before we give them the award. So in the application process, they don't have to do this, but before we award them, they need to have completed a FAFSA and have it on file with their institution of choice. I believe those are the those are the top criteria for the recipients. And is the application process difficult or is it um, pretty simple? Uh, I think that depends on who you ask. <laughs> um, it's not a difficult application. It is rather lengthy. We ask a lot of questions to kind of help the students to really think about how their intended major and their intended degree is going to impact their community. Um, really in the spirit of Eloise Cobell and the work that she did, the advocacy she did, we ask a lot of questions, but we tell students they're just answers to questions. They're not essays. Um, that word essay really paralyzes a lot of applicants. So we just tell them, read the question, read the whole question, um, and answer the questions to the best of your ability. We designed the application to guide them through all that thinking. It can appear daunting, but we just, you know, again, we try to let them know that this is their simple answers to simple questions, but we really want them to think about their responses. Those documents I referred to earlier, we ask students to read those documents because a lot of the questions kind of lead back to those documents. And we say, you know, based on what was said in this document? How do you see your degree doing this? We give students about three and a half months to complete the application. And so we really want to make sure that they know um, it's important to be thorough, to edit your, edit your responses, 
again, it's not difficult, but it's highly competitive. So we want applicants to really, really think through what it is they're saying. And I think that's true for all scholarship applications. Think about your answers as they relate to what the mission of the organization or the mission of the scholarship is. We do try to make it a little bit easier for us. I don't know about any of our peer organizations. We don't use the term competitors in the scholarship world. We're all peer organizations because we're all really just trying to reduce student loan debt for students. But we make it a little bit easier. We have embedded at each level There is a link to a short video about that level, about those questions, about what's going to happen next. It's kind of cute. We kind of created a little character. Her name is Anita, Anita Scholarship. Um, And Anita guides them through everything. Um, As we grow um, and as you watch Anita grow, she every now and then she'll change her, her native earrings, her native bling. It's kind of fun to watch Anita. So students enjoy watching it. We get a lot of comments about those. But again, because it's lengthy and because we know that everyone is busy, we advise the applicants to start the application early, return to it often, edit as often as needed, and don't wait until the deadline to start. Remember, it's a competitive process, and individuals who don't heed that advice and start early don't usually do well. One of the things we hear from the people who review these scholarship applications is they can tell when someone's waited to the last minute, the responses aren't well thought out. And they don't score well. My biggest advice for any scholarship is to start today. Most of us are online. Um, you can save the application and return to it um, as often as needed. How are applicants selected? So we have different kinds of scholarships. So we have vocational scholarships for trade school. Those are selected in-house by the staff, really, as they're completed. That's kind of an evaluation of the students' um, coursework and where they are in their program. We want to get um, individuals through their trade school as quickly as possible so they can return to their communities to contribute to the um, local economies. All of the completed and submitted applications are reviewed on a strict schedule for any of these. We also have a summer fellowship for doctoral researchers who can um, research in the summer. Those are selected by a group of doctoral practitioners all over the United States, American Indian, Alaska Native, PhDs. So they're really having their peers look at those applications. And again, they're ranked and scored. And those students receive $5,000 in the summer to continue their research. And they can use that for whatever they need. Oftentimes, it's travel to do some research. Our summer fellowships are also reviewed in-house. Staff really looks at those responses and evaluates transcripts to make sure that we can get students through school in the summer who need it. We have priorities listed on the application itself as to who really should apply for summer. We have a very limited amount of funds, so we try to really fund those people who need summer school. Um, Otherwise, the main scholarships, the undergraduate and graduate level scholarships for the academic years, are they're reviewed by external reviewers. We hire American Indian Alaska Native practitioners in higher education and college preparation and um, in tribal education departments, tribal scholarship programs. We hire them to review all of the applications that are completed twice. They rank them, they score them. Sometimes they make comments on them, especially if somebody scores really well or really badly. Um, We want to make sure that we can give them feedback if they need it. So we ask reviewers to do that. That is done through the month of April every year. And on May 1st, or the first week of May, we then let people know that they're either a finalist or on a wait list or they're um, not funded. We want to make sure people know they're not funded so they can search for other funding or that they can alert other funders that they, I didn't get this, but hey, I'm still waiting on you guys. Um, We want to make sure that. And then when we make an offer, Finalists have 10 days to accept the offer. Um, everything is done online. Um, there's no paper to send back and forth, nothing to fax. In fact, we don't, we don't even own a fax machine. Um, everything is done right within their the file where they began the application itself. And then they have the entire summer to get us the documents they need, all their transcripts, their grades, their course enrollments. Um, for the most part, We do require that someone is enrolled in their tribe, as stated earlier. We actually do most of that work for the tribes that will work with us. 
we they have a special link to our system where they can go in, see who from their tribe is applying or got an op, um, offer, and they can verify it right there within the system. So this um, applicant or the finalist does not have to go to their tribe, doesn't have to try to get the paperwork. For mo most tribes do, do that with us. And we do the same type of system with colleges and universities. And this all happens over the summer. Um, when most people are enjoying their summers, my team is chasing this stuff down every day all summer to make sure students um, get their money in August when they need it. And Melvin, how many scholarships have you distributed? So we opened in 2015, um, about, I want to say February, we started in February of 2015. Since that day, we have funded 4,600 scholars. Uh, more than that, I just signed another handful of checks today. These students have attended over 750 schools. Though that means we've distributed more than 13,000 individual scholarships since February of 2015. Um, and we've also supported 31 summer research fellows. Every summer, five, are, five of them are funded. Um, last year, we had a tiebreaker, and instead of breaking the tie, we awarded two of them. So we had six of them last summer. And um, do you have any favorite success stories? You know, we we love all of our scholars. Um, they're telling us stories all the time. A couple of things as an organization that we've done that we're really proud of and that um, makes us happy is those 31 summer research fellows. Um, all 31 of them, when they apply and they get this get this um, fellowship, they do not have their dissertation yet. And since we started the program. Um, I was notified today that there are 17 of them who have completed their PhDs and our practitioners in their fields or um, instructors in their fields. That's kind of one of my favorite stories. And the other is really working and collaborating with what we call the National Native Scholarship Providers Working Group. Myself with the CEOs of the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, Native Forward Scholars Fund, and the American Indian College Fund got together and said, you know, we really need to learn more about what's happening with Native students all over. We all fund the same students at different times in their, um, in their academic careers, from tribal colleges and community college all the way through doctoral programs. So they find, they find us individually at different times in their career. So we started a research project funded by a couple of national foundations, and we've recently published what is called the um, American Indian Student Affordability, College Affordability Research Project. Um, it's linked on our website at cobellscholar.org, um, also on the websites of those peer organizations I talked about. We find that to be a success for, because for years, scholarship organizations, like I said earlier, were almost competitive with one another. But we realize we all look for different funding sources. We also all fund students at different parts of their career. So we are partners and peers rather than competitive. And it's really changed a lot for the way we work together and the way that our students and scholars see us. And Melvin, um, how can our listeners learn more about the Cobell Scholarship and how can they contact you for further questions? So to find out more about us, um, we are very deliberate in keeping our website as sparse as possible. Go to cobellscholar.org. Um, our history is there, um, uh, stories about the um, Eloise herself and about the settlements are right there, um, eligibility criteria. Um, I am told that we are uploading links right now to all of those fellows and the work that they've done. So um, you can read about who's out there doing what in Indian country. Um, to contact us, please don't contact me because, like I said, I have an amazing team and they do all the work and they know everything. Um, I just knew to hire very, very good people. So they should email is the best way to reach out. Scholarships at cobellscholar.org. Um, all of the staff have access to that email account and they all respond usually within two business days or 48 hours. Um, but oftentimes within the hour, um, if someone is looking at that email account. Um, that's the best way to um, 
reach out to us and ask questions. Would like to thank you, Melvin, for taking time out to talk to us today to tell us about this amazing scholarship, the Cobell Scholarship that you have to offer. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening to Native Talk Arizona, presented by Native Health and 90.7 FM KRDP. Our executive producer is Susan Levy, sound engineer is Javier Quiroga, and our host is Lanasha Puadi. We hope you will tune in again next week. If you have any questions, please reach us at nativetalkaz at listen2krdp.com.